Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Florida Friendly Landscaping and how to uh, spend less on irrigation. I'm Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities. And um, this morning, I'm going to welcome my special guest, Karen Mojica. She's here from Hernando County Mosquito Control. So before we begin, we're going to let Karen, we're going to hear a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Go ahead, Karen. Good morning. Thanks, Lily. Um, as she said, my name is Karen. I work for Hernando County Mosquito Control. And um, Lily's always very accommodating to let us uh, get the word out about mosquito control during her classes. We appreciate that. Um, just want everyone to know that even though it's cold out there, um, the mosquitoes are very much lighter than normal when it's hotter. Um, however, they are still laying eggs and there are still eggs out there. So don't let your guard down. Uh, continue to dump and drain any standing water. Um, I also wanted to do a reminder too as well that um, we don't just send our trucks out. So a lot of times I'll get uh, requests that they haven't seen the trucks. Uh, we don't schedule those. Those are done on an at need basis. Those are kind of our final resort. Um, First, what we do is our technicians come out to wherever there is a being a problem with mosquitoes. They'll do a quick inspection, um, see where they're coming from, treat that spot that they're coming from, and then if needed, do a spray or a truck at night if it's needed at that point. Um, so if you don't see the truck, it's not because we're forgetting you. It's just that uh, we try to pinpoint where our trouble spots are and not just do a, an overspray. Um, the second reminder is that we do have our tire amnesty and that is coming up January 23rd. It is a Saturday and that is a day when people can bring tires, um, pretty much junk tires, and they can bring them there at no charge. Uh, we will have some big semis there. You do need to um, offload your own tires onto the semis, but our guys are there for assistance. Uh, it is unlimited. You could bring as many as you have. Um, it is not for commercial use. Our stores, our tire changing facilities are not to use that. This is for the residents. Um, so if you have dumped tires on your property that have been sitting there, um, some sometimes last year we had people who found them in the woods nearby their house and they gathered them together and brought them over. Um, it is a great opportunity to clean up. Um, as you know, tires are a big uh, hiding spot for mosquitoes. It's a very big breeding spot for mosquitoes. So if they're collecting water, that dark uh, area there is, is really um, a big breeding spot. So that's why we offer this. Uh, we usually do it once a year and it's gonna be this year, January 23rd. It's from nine to three and it's at the Hernando County Fairgrounds on 41, which is uh, North Broad Street. And I think that's about it. Any questions, please just um, put it in the, the comments there and I'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Okay, well, thank you, Karen. Thank um, you. And I noticed one of your Facebook posts um, kind of made it clear, like if you have water that froze in your bird bath or something like that, that don't assume that you have frozen and killed the mosquito eggs. Correct. Correct. They will wait for you. Nope. <laughs> they'll wait for the warmer weather and then they'll hatch. And they will still hatch out. So we still need to be diligent about um, at least once a week, if you have a bird bath, cleaning it out, not only just replacing the water, um, but using a brush to get around the edges because that is a lot of where they lay the eggs. Yes. And those eggs will die as soon as they hit the ground, but Correct. frozen water is not going to kill them. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Karen. Let me, thank let's you. get started on today's program. Share my screen here. Okay. All right. How to spend less on lawn irrigation. Thank you for joining us this morning. I work uh, for Hernando County Utilities. 
and I work in the water conservation department. So when customer service has somebody um, who, you know, wants to call and they can't find out any other particular circumstance that made them have such a high bill, then they usually get sent to me and we talk about various ways in which they're doing things and how they can change some of their cultural practices. And I usually, because there's so much to say, I end up sending them an email with a whole bunch of information. And I thought, you know, why don't I turn what I say in those emails into an actual PowerPoint presentation so that, and make this video of it so that um, everyone can know, you know, what it is that maybe they're doing that they can do differently. So, um, we don't have such thirsty lawns. You can see behind me today, I'm coming to you straight from your lawn, from deep inside your lawn. And we're going to talk about um, ways we can save money and still keep our lawns looking happy and healthy. Um, my program is Florida Friendly Landscaping and here are the nine principles. And we're going to cover a lot of them actually today, focusing on number two, um, watering efficiently, but some of the others will come into play as well. Okay. Move that box. There we go. All right. The first thing you need to do if you are new in Florida or you're new to uh, being a homeowner, and so you've got this new house and you look out there and maybe it's brand new sod. There are pallets of sod sitting on the side of the road. Um, just down my street right now, there's a new home built there. And that is what they're waiting to do is put that sod in. And if those of you who have um, dealt with building a home, that's when you know you can't get your CO till that sod is down. So, so you've got it down, you've moved in, or maybe you've moved into an older established home and you're looking at this lawn and you're like, what now? What do I do with it? Well, first of all, it's not just grass. <laughs> you got to figure out what kind of lawn it is to know how to take care of it properly. So here are the different types of lawns in our, in Central Florida. There's St. Augustine, which the most common variety you're going to see around here is Floritam. Floritam is a variety of St. Augustine. So you can get that right in your head. There's other varieties. There's bitter blue, there's um, centennial, there's things like that. But what we are going to see 99.9% .9 of the time is Floritam. There's also Bahia grass. Um, these two, Floritam and Bahia grass, are what 95% of our lawns here in Hernando County and around Central Florida are. So you probably have one of those two. Um, there's not that many zoysia grass lawns in this area. The villages, they're full of zoysia grass. So if you have friends in the villages and stuff, it's very possible that's what they have is zoysia grass. Bermuda grass is another, um, there's many different varieties of that. There's the, uh, you know, the very, short growing kind that they use on golf courses then all the way up to wild Bermuda, which grows like crazy all through your flower beds and um, not too much Bermuda grass around here. And then I put this on the bottom. Maybe you have a diverse lawn area, which means it's just a mixture of very, you know, maybe started out as Bahia grass like mine. Mine started as Bahia. I still have a lot of Bahia, but there's a lot of weeds in there too. So I call that a diverse lawn area. And I've heard somebody else refer to it as a freedom lawn because it's a freedom lawn because I'm not all that too worried about it. It just does its thing out there. So most likely you either have Floritam or Bahia. Those are the first things to know. If you have a Floritam lawn, um, it's going to have those wider blades and it's going to be a darker green than the Bahia grass. Um, 
some people say they move here and think, well, why are they using crabgrass as a lawn? That's sort of kind of what Floritam looks like. Um, it is only propagated vegetatively. In 1973, it was, you know, created in a lab, more or less. Um, and it was a uh, collaboration between the University of Florida and Texas A&M to take St. Augustine grass and um, have it not be as susceptible to chinch bugs. And we will get into that <laughs> further on in this in this video or in this class, but um, that was in 1973. Hence its name. Remember I said it was the University of Florida and Texas A&M. That's why they named it Floritam. And so it is not a conspiracy that you can't buy seed for it. It's just seed doesn't exist because it was created <laughs> vegetatively. Um, so it can only be grown by sod and it grows in runners and it spreads nice and quickly and gets usually pretty thick. Um, Floritam, it can survive on natural rainfall to a point, but it needs, it needs supplemental irrigation um, in order to thrive and do well. Now, we just had another freeze overnight. So let me tell you if your lawn looks hay colored, and we're changing the name, it's golden. If you have a golden lawn right now, that's okay. It's gonna come back. It, it, it's, you don't have to force it to try and come back. It'll come back when the weather warms up, when we have longer daylight hours. The other type of grass that is very common around here, you'll, this is the type that they put on the sides of the roads. You'll see it also in fields. Um, there's a, um, the best variety of bahia grass for a home lawn would be Argentine bahia. But it was uh, imported from Brazil like in 1913, something like that. If you notice a trend here, there's no native lawn grass in Florida. Despite that name, St. Augustine, there is no um, well, the original name came from bunch grasses that they found along the coast, but if you let it grow two feet tall, it looks fantastic, but there is no meadow type grass that is native to Florida. So that you, that will help you understand, you know, we're, we're forcing a non-native thing to try and do, uh, you know, something almost against nature here in Florida. So Bahia grass, it is lighter green. Um, it has an open growth habit. It doesn't grow in runners. So you'll see like a clump here and a clump here and a clump here. And some people don't like that because that leaves open areas where weed encroachment can and does occur. You can grow Bahia grass by seed. So that is something people like because it's cheaper that way, but I would still recommend sod if you're starting brand new, like, you know, in a totally newly built home because seed will, the seed is very hard. Um, it will take a very, very long time to germinate. It doesn't have a um, huge germination, you know, rate percentage wise. So what's gonna happen is before those seeds sprout, you're going to have weeds come in way before that. So it is better to, um, if you're starting new with Bahia, to start with sod. Um, I personally am a Bahia fan because it can survive on natural rainfall. That's my lawn you're looking at right there, that picture, that's mine. Um, not right now, <laughs> not this morning, no. This morning it is golden with a little frost on top of it. Um, but it can survive on natural rainfall and it'll turn that golden color, but as soon as it rains, it'll, it's like somebody has applied instant chlorophyll to it. And it will go semi-dormant as will the St. Augustine grass and turn golden in the uh, winter and that is okay. So now maybe you have an idea if you go out and look, you know, what kind of lawn 
that you have, whether it's the Floritam or the Bahia. A lot of people have Floritam in the front and Bahia in the back. That occurs as well. Now, how much water does this lawn actually need? We move in and we either leave the time clock the way the sod company set it or the way the former owner set it. And then we're like, oh my gosh, why is my bill so high? So let's talk about how much does that lawn really need? I already mentioned Bahia grass will uh, survive, do fine on natural rainfall. I don't have an irrigation system. I also don't live in a deed restricted community. So there's different standards in what you're looking for in a lawn as well. Say you have this uh, Floritam lawn, you live in, in a deed restricted community that has pretty high standards. So you know you need to have this irrigation system and keep it watered. What next? How much does it really need? Research at the University of Florida shows that your Floritam lawn um, needs half an inch to three quarters of an inch per watering event. Now we here in Hernando County are on one day a week watering and that goes by your address. And I think I forgot to put the chart um, in this presentation. So I'll be sure when the recording comes to put it in the comments as to when your day is, it goes by your address. Um, I will tell you though that um, the times that you're allowed to water are after 6 p.m. or before 8 a.m. That's not and, that's or. And it is healthier for your lawn to have it be wrapping up close to that 8 a.m. than to start it at 6 p.m. That's just some tips for you. The other thing I want you to remember is this is for every person who, who has an irrigation system in Hernando County, even if they have a well. So keep that in mind. And if your friends up here in the Royal Highlands where I live and we have wells, if they think differently, tell them, oh no, those uh, restrictions are for everybody. Now, how are you gonna figure out <coughs> how much time does it take? That's what you're gonna ask me. I need to know how long to put on each zone. That half inch to three quarters of an inch isn't making sense to me. How long do I put on each zone? Do you want that simple answer, which I can't give you because there are different circumstances. There are different variables. I don't know your water pressure. I don't know how many zones you have. I don't know what kind of heads you have in each zone. So, <laughs> There's a really, really simple way to figure this out though. First, let me tell you what that half inch to three quarters of an inch is going to accomplish for you. It's going to soak into our sandy soils about a foot down. Now this time of year, our roots have sloughed off due to the winter. So they're not down there very far at all. In the summer, you know, they may go down about eight inches. So you're definitely reaching the root system and beyond, and you are encouraging a deeper root system. If you only, um, um, some people say, no, 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 I have to water twice a week, which is against the rules, by the way. What they are doing though, is encouraging a very shallow root system because you're always handing out that water to the lawn instead of encouraging the lawn to get a job and grow its roots and go down and look for that water. So that's what that amount is gonna do for you. And here's how you can figure it out. You're sitting here staring at these tuna cans. What you can do is get some tuna cans, get some cat food cans, get some gladware, get whatever that you know is straight-sided and get a Sharpie and a measuring tape measure that half inch inside and mark that with you know your sharpie then put the tuna cans randomly around your particular zone turn that zone on 
You're allowed to be testing your irrigation system during the day, as long as you're standing out there watching it and obviously testing it. Time how long it took to get each of those cans up to that half inch. And then turn it off and go and write down, okay, that was zone one and that took 30 minutes or however long it took. Repeat that with each zone. If you're not already doing that, you will, you will see a difference in your water bill if you have left it on from what the sod companies have done, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute, a lot of times they tell, they set it for like an hour per zone to get that lawn established, which is not the way to do it, by the way. And so, you know, that costs people a lot more money than they need to be spending. And here, let me tell you a secret about lawns because people get very frustrated with lawns and say lawns are big water hogs, Lawns waste water, lawns, you know, are overly thirsty. None of that is true because lawns don't waste water. Lawns use exactly the amount of water that they need. They're not the ones who go, you know, the lawn doesn't shimmy up to your garage and put that irrigation system on. You're the one who does that. You're the one in control. So we need to get to know um, you know, our lawn's needs so that we supply an efficient amount to keep the lawn healthy, exactly what it needs, instead of giving it more than it needs, because it's not going to use more than it needs. And that's, so we are the ones that are wasting the water, not the lawns. Your bahia grass, as I said before, it can survive on natural rainfall. Mine does. If you wanna keep it you know, at a certain level of nice, <laughs> you can go ahead and water it um, that half inch to three quarters of an inch as well, but you don't wanna overwater it. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna discuss that in a couple slides as well. Here's how. Let your lawn communicate its needs to you. We've already you know, ascertained that we're just throwing water out there and it's only going to use what it needs to use. It's not going to use more. Um, it's not, you know, plants aren't like us. They don't overeat or overdrink. They use exactly what they want and the rest just is going to, or they use exactly what they need. The rest is going to leach down into the aquifer, evaporate up or become stormwater runoff, which takes pollutants to our waterways. So now that we have made this, we've gone out, we've do, we have learned what kind of lawn we have. Okay, I have a Floritam lawn. Okay, now I know it needs half an inch to three quarters of an inch per watering event. I did not say once a week, did I? And we'll get into that as well right here. Now we're going to get to know our lawn even more. We're going to, instead of being Lord of the lawn, we're gonna let it talk to us. <laughs> Let's go out and communicate with this lawn. If it needs water, it's gonna tell you in a couple of ways. The blades, if over 50% of the blades are folded in half like this, it's trying to conserve water, not get as much of the sun on it, so that means, huh, okay, you're gonna need some water on my next watering day. Or if you walk across it and you can still see your footprints there for a little while, that also means the blades are dehydrated. So those are two ways that your lawn can tell you, I'm getting dehydrated, I need some water. That's not the time to panic. That's the time to say, okay, when it's my next watering day, if we don't get rain between now and then, I will go ahead and water you. So what I'm kind of encouraging you to do is to turn your irrigation system to off and just operate it manually when you can see those signs that your lawn needs water. That will save you a lot of money instead of just saying, well, it's Monday better water, 
<laughs> maybe your lawn doesn't need it. Maybe it's had enough rain. Maybe it's not the time of year when it really loses a lot of water. There are lots of variables there. Okay. Now, the other thing you got to get to know, you got to, you got to know your lawn. You know what kind you have. You're letting it talk to you about when it needs water. Now there's that system that delivers that water. And this isn't as, as exciting to me. I'd rather get to know this living thing, the lawn, than actual this mechanic thing, but you know, it delivers water. So we gotta, we gotta know how to do that and what we're doing. The first thing you gotta do is go to that weird box in your garage and make sure it is set properly. Um, did you change it when the time changed? That's something to think about. You know, put that on your list. When time changes, I need to check my smoke detector batteries and I need to make sure I set my irrigation system. Um, this is if you, if you keep it on automatic. If you don't have a manual, if it got lost somewhere along the way or you never had it, Every manual is available online. So I'm sure you can go in, look up your model number, go in online and find a PDF of your manual. Study it, get to know it, just figure out you know, how this system works. <clears throat> and one thing you can do, and you should do this fairly often, conduct, a, um, conduct an evaluation of your entire system. Um, that go around. You can, as I said, you can put it on in the, on during the day if you are testing things out. Put it on and see if you have any anything spouting up like Old Faithful there. That's a problem, <laughs> and that's a big waste of money that you would not have known if you didn't do this evaluation during the day. Because where are you generally when this irrigation system is on? All comfy, cozy, sleeping in your bed, right? <laughs> and so. So check for those broken um, sprinkler heads. Check for misaligned heads. Are you irrigating your driveway or the street or your house? Or did a tree that was small when the system um, was set up grow in the way and there's just a head just, just bouncing against the tree, not getting the turf beyond it? not doing the turf any good and not doing that tree any good. Check for all of those things and get them repaired. Clogged heads, we have a lot of sand here. Heads get clogged pretty easily. So then you have a uh, inefficient amount of spray coming out of them. Mismatched sprinkler heads, this would be, um, if this is difficult you know, to fix without redoing, redoing your entire system, but there should not be different kinds of heads in different zones. A properly built system has the same kind of heads in one zone, meaning you shouldn't have the circular little one that pops up and sends out water in a circle around in the same zone as one that has the types. So that's just you know something to check out there. Underground leaks, underground leaks are so difficult because in our sandy soil, we may not know. Maybe you're lucky and you find an area that is just kind of soppy. And so you suspect that there's an underground leak there. But what can happen in our sandy soil is water just pouring out of one of these pipes underground and you'll never know it except you have a higher than normal bill. So that if you're not, you know, don't think you are um, knowledgeable enough to do all this on your own, which I certainly wouldn't know how to fix an underground leak. It is well worth it to have an irrigation contractor come out at least once a year, check things out for you. It's gonna be a lot cheaper to get that uh, underground leak fixed as soon as possible than to let it continue to spew out the water. Because 
here's what an underground leak looks like, you know, underground, it's ugly, muddy, icky, you know, not a lot of fun. But what's worse is this is someone's actual bill in 2017. And I know it's difficult to read. Um, Karen and I can read it because she used to work for utilities. So let's look over this person's bill. Let's just say here on uh, in December of 2016, they used 9,200 gallons, whoops. And so they owed us $20.29. Then something bad happened. They had an underground leak, stop moving on me, in January of 17. And they used 218,700 gallons of water. And their bill was $2,606.76. That's what a leak really looks like. I promise you, <laughs> to get a an, an, uh, professional out there and get that fixed as soon as possible will be far cheaper than that. Now, if that does happen to you um, and you're a customer of ours, you can call and ask about getting an adjustment. That's a once a year um, benefit to you. You would have to uh, provide receipts to show proof of repair and um, make a good faith payment while they evaluate the situation and I mean, you probably won't be paying $20 like you did before, but it also won't be uh, the 2000. They'll try and try and work with you on that. And so that's a once a year benefit for you, but that's not a bill anyone wants to see. So stay ahead, stay ahead of those. <clears throat> now there are other things other than how we water our lawn that actually affects our water bill in our lawn. So let's talk about the other cultural practices. This I drive home all the time. If you don't remember anything after this, I want you to remember this. Don't mow too low. And everybody does. Ma lawns to have a healthy St. Augustine and Bahia grass lawn they have to be mowed at four inches or higher. You can see this one is not. And you might think, oh, that's a little high. I don't want it that high. For the health of your lawn, especially the St. Augustine lawns, this is really the key. If you mow too low, it opens the door to many other issues that cause your lawn to fail. The good news is it's such an easy fix. It's such an easy thing to do, to just let it grow. Let it be at four inches. If you have a company that does this for you, get that measuring stick out there. See that they're mowing at four inches. It is critical to the health of your lawns, especially your St. Augustine lawns. Now, what about insects? Now, I mentioned before, when they made Floritan lawns, when they created them, um, is because they wanted to create a variety that was uh, resistant to chinch bugs. <laughs> that was in 73. Probably by 78, Floritan lawns were no longer resistant to chinch bugs. That didn't last very long. But I'm not gonna dwell on that because Chinch bugs don't seem to be a problem anymore. 10 years ago and before that, sure, they were. They were, you know, the main problem in Floritan lawns. Not anymore. I've talked to many master gardeners, tell me they haven't seen a chinch bug in three or four years. So if your lawn company is still telling you that they're treating for chinch bugs, ask them to show them to you. As uh, Jim Davis, the county extension director, he talks about companies treating for invisible chinch bugs. And that seems to be what is occurring. There is um, a problem with our Floritan lawns that many, many Floritan lawns are experiencing right now, but it is not insect related. It is actually um, fungal related. And we'll talk more about that. 
So just remember, if your lawn has a problem, doesn't automatically mean that problem is a bug. Not a, and so not every problem is an insect problem. And you may have a few chinch bugs, but um, there's always, there's a level at which they become a problem. And we haven't reached that in quite some time. So every problem is not always an insect problem. And guess what? Every insect, it, not every insect is a problem. You might have all sorts of great bugs in there that are helping you out, that are beneficial to you. And if you broadcast spray of pesticide all over the lawn, because you're trying to kill invisible chinch bugs, you have just killed all the good guys who are really there to help you. So you really need to determine what the problem is before treating it. Don't decide it is insects without evidence that it is insects. And a pesticide is not going to do a thing against a fungus. So you have to use the right product for the right problem. And if you have a problem, spot treat where that problem exists only. Don't broadcast all over the entire yard. I have fire ants, so I put a fire ant bait on the fire ant mountains. I don't spread it all over the entire yard. Florida Friendly Landscaping recommends spot treating only where you have the problems. <coughs> Here is our main uh, enemy number one of Floritam grass at this point in time, and it is not a chinch bug. It's not any bug <laughs> at all. It is a fungus called take all root rot. So this is what it looks like in the roots. Those roots should be uh, white and healthy looking. And they are not. <laughs> Let me move that out of my way. There we go. Um, so is your lawn sick? You see these black roots? That, that is not a good looking thing. So take all root rot is a fungus that is extremely common all through central Florida in uh, St. Augustine Floritam lawns. What opens the door for this fungus is mowing too low. That's number one. <laughs> Watering too much and fertilizing too much. This fungus exists in our soil. So a lot of times this fungus may kill out an entire lawn and people's Homeowners associations makes them replace that lawn with the exact same type of lawn. So if you have a problem with a plant and it dies and you put the same plant right there, chances are it's going to have the same problem. It's in the soil. Even if you bulldozed out all your soil and replaced it, conditions in our area exist for it to grow in the soil again. So this sounds pretty drastic and terrible, and, but it's not all bad news because you can make your lawn able to fight it. If you mow it at four inches, you don't give it too much water, and you don't feed the fungus with the fertilizer by fertilizing too much. So that is one way to overcome this. The Haya grass, and uh, their take all root rot has been found in Bahia grass, but Bahia grass does not seem to be terribly affected by it. So if you have the opportunity to change and you're allowed to change your type of lawn, you might want to consider if your St. Augustine has died out from take all root rot, replacing it with Bahia instead. Um, I discussed over fertilizing is not good for your lawn. And we are just about to enter our blackout period here in Hernando County in accordance with our uh, fertilizer ordinance. January 1st through March 31st, homeowners are not allowed to apply fertilizer to their lawns. If you have a vegetable garden or um, uh, something in beds, you can apply fertilizer to those but not to your lawn. 
this is not a terrible rule because your lawns don't need it right now. They're that golden color. They're not growing, are they? So lawns that don't aren't actively growing are not in need of fertilizer and don't have the ability to take it up. Remember I said during the winter, the roots become very shallow. Therefore, they don't have the ability or the need to take this fertilizer up in the system of the lawn. So what's gonna to happen to it? The rains and your irrigation system are gonna push it down to the aquifer, sending nitrates into our aquifer. So that is why we want to avoid this. Um, and you don't need to hurry up and run out and fertilize now. Now is not the time, especially with the frosts that we just had. Wait till uh, beginning of April before you wanna consider fertilizing. And then follow that label, follow that label very well. The label is the law. You'll want something that has a very low middle number. 15, 0, 15, 12, 2, 12, something like that, because that middle number, well, it's NPK. So nitrogen, potassium, no, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sorry about that. We don't need any phosphorus. Um, our main industry here in Hernando County are, is phosphate mines. We've got it, we've got it in the soil, not to mention it is generally used um, to encourage flowering. We're not looking for our lawns to be flowering. So that's just an added something we don't need to be putting there. So try to get as low of a middle number as possible. And as I just mentioned with the uh, phosphate mines, we're not up north. We don't need to sweeten the soil. Adding lime is going to accomplish nothing. There's no reason uh, to do that. Another thing that can help you though um, with your nutrient needs of your lawn is to don't bag up those lawn clippings. Just let them go when you mow. That does not create thatch. What creates thatch is overwatering, which creates that shallow root system and that almost that hydroponic type lawn that's solely dependent on water and starts the runners just start to grow very near the surface. That's what causes thatch. So if you don't bag your lawn clippings and return them to the soil, they contain enough nitrogen that you can actually skip one fertilization a year. And here's another idea, and this is kind of new and upcoming and exciting, I think, the idea of compost as pertain to your lawn. There are some companies out there <clears throat> you can look into it, that um, provide a product, a composted product. There's one um, around here. The product itself is called Command with one M in the middle. So you can maybe find a company that will provide that for you. And what one thing that they do is if you're getting new sod, is they put that compost product down before they put the sod down. That has shown some really promising, um, you know, some really promising benefits, improving the water holding capacity of that soil. Now, not forever, because things leach very quickly through our sandy soil. So after a year or two, then the homeowner is encouraged to top dress, that kind of means sprinkle, like you're applying fertilizer, but top dress the um, compost on their lawn to let it seep through every couple of years. This you're allowed to do during our fertilizer blackout period because it is not fertilizer. And what it really does is just improve that, um, the porosity and the nutrient holding and water holding capacity of your soil. So that's something really to uh, look into. What about weeds? Well, I, as I told you, I have a freedom lawn, so I don't worry about weeds unless they are sand spurs. And then I just pull them up and throw them away. Um, the, but the biggest thing I want you to know about weeds is not to use weed and feed combinations. Those do not work out here in Florida. 
and I know they're available in the store, just like fertilizer is available in the store between January 1st and March 31st. That does not give you permission to put it down on your lawn. Weed and feed products, first of all, if you're going to try and catch some of these spring weeds, you want to apply a pre-emergent, maybe beginning of February, mid-February um, herbicide. That's not, that's, you're not allowed to fertilize then. It's also not a time recommended to fertilize. So as you can see, those are two different applications that should occur at two different times. Also, it gets very tricky. We have had people kill their entire lawns with weed and feed products. I've heard about it, you know, it's, it's fairly common. One gentleman we talked to, he put it down, killed his entire lawn, and it said for St. Augustine lawns right on it, not just for Southern lawns, it said for St. Augustine lawns. And after he killed his lawn, he read the very small writing that said not Floritan. So you just have to be so ultra careful. Killing weeds is a difficult process. Broadleaf weeds are usually easier to kill because the, um, and to deal with because the system, you know, is taught to seek out broadleaf plants and kill them. Got to be careful when you apply them around your trees or your shrubs because it's not going to know what weed you want, what weed you don't want. It's just going to go after all broad leaves. Grassy weeds are much more difficult. There are products out there that can tell the difference, but then you have to be careful that if you have a Floritan lawn, you make sure you get a product for a Floritan lawn because it will kill Bahia grass and vice versa. Then there are other products that just doesn't know one grass from the other. So if you have a grassy weed like crabgrass or things like that, it's not gonna know. So it is, it's a very difficult process to try and figure out. And also many herbicides are temperature sensitive, meaning once it's above 85 during the day regularly, um, you basically can't use those herbicides. What I would suggest is that you contact the county extension office and Dr. Lester or a master gardener who can you know, tell them about your specific weed. You can bring them by so they can ID them and you know, they can help you with the right product. Stuff you find online, these homemade concoctions or what your neighbor told you, they may actually work as total vegetation killers, but not getting it won't know your grass from any other weed. Also, it is illegal to use a product outside of its labeling, meaning if it's not labeled as an herbicide, it is actually illegal to use it as an herbicide. And these pretty weeds right here, this dollar weed, um, actually they're native, native pennywort, um, <laughs> and they're edible. Uh, but if you have them and you don't want them, you might wanna look into your watering habits because they only thrive where it is very wet. Now, maybe you have a low area that you're not watering and it is, it's just naturally wet, but that, that's kind of an indicator weed right there that there is a moisture or a water problem in that area of your yard. Okay, let's say you got new sod, like my soon to be new neighbors down the street. Um, you have new sod how are you gonna make a home for this new sod? First thing I wanna tell you is don't do what the sod company says. And I've heard this so many times. While the sod guy said, just water each zone for an hour a day. Please don't do that. Your new saw doesn't have any roots. It has no way of taking up that much water. And remember that new lawn is not wasting water. Who's wasting water? We're the ones doing that. And you'll even see the water running off because the lawn has no way to uh, take it up. New lawns need frequent light watering. And we have a chart, which I will show you in order to get established. And you are allowed a 60 day variance from the one day a week watering, but you have to follow the chart very specifically. It's not the time to fertilize. That's not when you wanna fertilize. Don't stress the lawn out by fertilizing it. And 
if you're getting new sod, you know, talk to your sod company or whoever you have doing it. See if they know about that compost program of putting the compost underneath the new sod. They do it a lot up in on top of the world. It's where UF has been doing studies on it, but I know it's been happening down in our part of the world as well on a smaller basis. Here is a small part of the new sod watering schedule. The best thing to do if you're gonna get new sod is call me um, or email me and ask for this schedule. You see, um, it says day one, five to 10 minutes, two to three times a day. By the time you get to day 11, one time a day, a quarter inch. Day 20, every other day, half an inch. And it goes like that for about 60 days. Not only is this the rules <laughs> that you're allowed to water for new sod, this is the most beneficial way to water for your sod. And the third thing is it's the most economic way to water in new sod. I was watching a gentleman um, in one of our communities who got new sod, he had the compost put down and I know he followed he followed this uh, chart to the T and his bill did not go up horribly. A lot of people, their bill may, you know, be a thousand dollars when they get new sod. It doesn't need to be that high if you follow this schedule. It will go up because you're using more water and you want to budget that into the overall cost of your new lawn. But it shouldn't, you know, be terrible. Also, you can get that uh, an adjustment um, for having new sod um, from the water company. You can get that adjustment, but remember you get one a year. So if you do it for your sod and you have a big leak, you're not going to get another one in that year. So right now we are in the cool season. And if you notice, it's pretty cool outside. So the things I want you to know about the cool season, again, is now is not the time to fertilize. It's also not the time to treat for pet pests. You want to treat when the pests are active. No um, pesticide, you know, is going to kill pests that aren't there <laughs> or that aren't being very active. So just don't do anything to the lawn that overstresses it. It's in a semi-dormant stage. Let it go and let it sleep. And as far as watering goes, here's one of our golden lawns in this picture. It's okay. I know we think we're in the tropics, but we're not. We're in central Florida and um, we're subtropical. And we have winters. We have winters three days at a time in the cool season with warm fronts in between those three days. Right now we're in one of our three day winters again. Um, and what it does is it, you know, frosts your lawn and turns it this golden color. That's okay. You, you can't water it back green. You can't fertilize it back green. Nothing you can do is gonna push it back to being green except just waiting, waiting for spring waiting for the days to get longer and waiting for it to recuperate. So it doesn't even need water as much. You can skip a week. Remember I said it, um, you need a quarter inch to three quarters of an inch per watering event. Doesn't have to be once a week, especially in the winter. It's okay to go 14 days or so in between. And a lot of times what happens is these cold fronts they come in with rain and go out with rain. So that helps us as well. What about the other uh, plants in your yard? I went from kind of, you know, kind of a doll kind of picture there to, well, really getting your senses there. What about those other landscape plants? Well, your trees and your shrubs, they don't need to be on the same irrigation system as your lawn. Lawns do require more water than tree, trees, shrubs. Trees and shrubs, once they're established, prefer actually and will do better and thrive on natural rainfall. 
and all your other landscape plants. They can probably survive on natural rainfall as well. Or you can get um, some kind of system there, a micro irrigation system, a drip irrigation system, so that you know, they are getting the water they need without you spending as much to give them the water as you would for your lawn. Also, the less lawn you have, the more then you will be worried about watering your lawn. So creating those bigger beds little by little over time and beds that thrive either on the uh, micro irrigation or on natural rainfall, that's gonna help save you a lot of money as well. But just remember your established trees and shrubs, they don't need um, supplemental rainfall. And if you feel that they do on occasion, maybe your shrubs on occasion, then you can bring out the hose and water them as needed at that time. So overall, how you're gonna save money on your water bill is to turn that system to manual, that irrigation system. So you put it on only on an as needed basis Get that catch can test done and set each zone so it delivers half an inch to three quarters of an inch. Let your lawn tell you when to water. Skip a week now in these winter months. Um, it, cap off the irrigation that is trying to get to your landscape plants and you can retrofit them into micro irrigation systems or just have them totally capped off and stay on top of that irrigation system um, often. Have a professional come out if you suspect any issues and have them come out you know, once a year just in general, but you should also go around and look for broken heads, misaligned heads, anything like that fairly often. All right, well, thank you uh, very much. Here is my email. Lily B at HernandoCounty.us. If you have, um, if you would like a PDF of this presentation, or if you have any uh, questions you want to email me, this will be recorded. If you have friends who want to see it, it'll be available probably this afternoon on Facebook, and then also it'll be available by the end of the week on the Hernando County Government YouTube channel. So if you have friends that just don't do Facebook, but they do YouTube, direct them, direct them there, Hernando County Government YouTube, and you'll see this plus several other presentations I've done. What we have coming up on uh, December 22nd, we're gonna start a three-part series on how to have a Florida-friendly certified yard. I don't have the word certified in there, but there's an actual checklist um, if you want to be officially certified, you can contact me after the programs and we can uh, work on that. But a lot of people are just curious, does my yard, you know, how Florida friendly is it? Does it really, you know, meet all the standards? And what little things do I have to do to tweak it? So it does. The other two parts, uh, Dr. Lester will be joining me for, and those will be on January 12th and January 19th. But the December classes coming up are part one of the checklist of the Florida Friendly Certified Yard. And on the 30th, we're gonna go over 21 landscape goals for 2021. And here's another little thing that has um, been coming across my email as well as Facebook that I found interesting. And if you know someone who's in the landscaping profession, and they really want to know more about Florida friendly landscaping and they would like to add that you know that little certification to their to their docket there to their resume that say hey I learned all about how to be Florida friendly because I know people call me all the time who well, what kind of landscaper or a yard company can I have come out that knows what Florida friendly means so there are a couple ways to do it. You can take an at your pace online module or take these classes on those dates there. And um, 
then you can be a certified professional. And I know me, if I was looking for a professional, I would want someone who learned about Florida friendly landscaping. So, and um, on the Florida friendly landscaping website in Gainesville, they have a list actually of everyone who has taken this. So it's a really good thing for professionals um, certifications to have. Okay, let's stop sharing. Let me see what we have in the chat. Oh, we just have Karen's information in the chat. Um, and that's her email. Thank you everybody for joining us this morning. As I said, this recording will be available soon on Facebook as well as on YouTube. So thank you everyone and I hope you have a good day and stay warm and I will see you on the 22nd.